Yep. Thanks for joining us today for Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz and our after show buzz reaction. I'm Ruth Nelson, joined by Hall of Famers Mick Haley, Bob Bertucci, and Brian Gimalero, bringing you the most current issues and trends in volleyball. Our weekly news show has leaders in our sport provide their perspective on the questions that are asked, along with the discussion on topics that are current and ones that are affecting all of us. Our news flash, 2021 NIA Women's Volleyball Championship Regional Pool Play matches started yesterday, continuing through December 2nd with video powered by Presto. In semifinals, December 3rd, championship on December 4th, which will be streamed on ESPN3. 2021 NJCAA Division I Iowa West Western wins back to back. Division II Parkland, Illinois wins it. And Division Three Owens Community College. 2021 NCAA Division II selected 64 teams. First rounds begin December 2nd through the 4th. And final eight will meet December 9th through the 11th in Tampa, Florida. Do you know a volleyball player that has an NIL deal? Please have them message us as we would like to share their story. Register today for the 2021 AVCA convention in Columbus, Ohio, December 15th through the 18th by jumping over to avcaconvention.org. Today, we will hear from two head coaches from teams that we feel have not been given enough credit or recognition for the many successes their teams have had. However, don't be surprised as both of these coaches will find a way to continue on the road to the NCAA championship. So let's head over to Austin, Texas, with former Olympic coach Mick Haley, who will introduce our first guest today. Mick? Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Uh, boy, we have Heather Olmstead with the BYU Cougars on today, and uh, she got a, well, I'll let her tell you about the draw, but she opens against Sean Garris's Boise team uh, in this uh, third season and uh, Heather, I call it the third season because, you know, we, we do that preseason stuff, then we do the conference, and now the, the real season starts. So how are you doing? And uh, tell us what you think about the draw. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, super excited to be playing in the NCAA tournament. It's every, every year it's exciting. And so drawing Boise State was, you know, it's actually interesting because it was the first year, and I don't know if this is good or bad, you guys can tell me, where we, we knew exactly what was going to pop up. We just didn't know if we were going to play Utah Valley or Boise State. I think when that starts to happen in a national tournament, we might want to look at some different avenues to go because um, I haven't been able to predict the bracket we were going to land in opening weekend, and this was the first year where we thought it was pretty obvious, um, although we, Utah could have been a host, as we know. Um, so still happy to play at home, very excited, grateful, and Boise State is hot right now, so they're, they're going to be a great match for us. Yeah, and your second match, if you get by uh, Sean and his crew, your second match, uh, we haven't seen a second round match like this in uh, a few years, and there's several in the way this bracket worked out. Uh, if you do win against Boise, what are you thinking about the rematch with Utah? Yeah, I think um, obviously there's some familiarity there with, with playing them, having played them once and playing them every year, knowing their players and their coaching staff, they, they have a great team. And so I think that's going to be uh, comforting that we have familiarity and we, we know what to expect. But we're looking to just work on the process of getting better this week for the match Friday against Boise and really focus on that. And then we'll focus on the next match once we get to that point, if, if we're lucky enough to, to advance this first round. Yeah, I saw the first match and uh, your fans, they didn't have a chance. If, if those fans show up again, uh, good luck, Utah. But Bob Bertucci's got a question or two he'd like to, to throw at you also. Bob, jump in here. Yeah, has a, thanks very much for coming on. I, I, I wanted to get a feel for how you thought your season went. Yeah, uh, 
super happy, pleased with our season. Um, we had some late additions, some transfers that we got late after last season, which was April, uh, which was, you know, six months ago or so. So really happy with our preseason, went out to Pitt, played a great match out there, got a feel for, for them and the level that they're playing at, played a good Utah team, um, played UNLV. We, we felt like we got tested in preseason and then to go into the West Coast Conference and play the way that we played and play San Diego and Pepperdine so well and LMU and some of those teams, everyone in our conference is gunning for us. They serve well. I mean, we never had any intentions to go undefeated. It's never a goal of ours that we talk about. So to end up, you know, winning conference without dropping a match and then to know that that hadn't been done since 1993 at BYU. I mean, I was blown away. I mean, Mick, Brian, you guys know Elaine Michaelis, what she's done, some of the coaches here, the teams and the players. So when people are telling me about that, I mean, that was just something to be proud of, not to, to really rest our laurels on because it's a new season. Like Mick said, we've got to play. It's a zero, zero, everybody postseason. And we, we got to win or go home, but really proud of the season. Felt like we got better over time. And uh, we just have a great group that's working hard, competitive. They love volleyball. They're competitors. And so they're going to get after it on Friday. How's the health of the team? And what do you, how do you feel your chances are going into this tournament? Yeah, I feel pretty good about where we're at. We're getting healthier every day, and I think that's going to help us going into the tournament. Um, obviously, trying to stay as healthy as we can with with COVID and some other things out there. I think I think that could be a storyline for the tournament this year is is COVID, and if there's any players or, or coaches that are going to be out because of that, I think that's going to be some unlucky um, stuff going on if that happens. And I just pray that doesn't happen to anyone, um, our team, and any other team in the tournament. Well, I think Brian has some some questions like that that are, that are more broad in, in looking at the whole the whole tournament. So, uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and ask Heather some of those questions? Sure, Heather, welcome. Thanks. Uh, the um, congratulations, wonderful season. Again, um, uh, you know, we will address the what you talked about in our buzz reaction after in the second half hour because the idea that you knew who you were going yeah. to play yeah. in an NCAA championship with 340 some teams and 64 being picked. You, you, every year, I knew two. I, I basically knew two. And, yep. uh, you know, you know, you're getting Utah Valley or Boise or Utah, and that has to be looked at. And we will address that. Yeah, but, we, need, we need people in your power with your experience to make some noise. That's what we need. Yeah, it, well, it, it's got to be more exciting for the players who are yeah. where are we going to go who are we going to play you know that it's and we'll we will talk about great that. listen great. the uh, but tell me at the end of the year here yeah i know you got to look at today but mm -hmm. at the end of the year here who do you think is playing the best what teams are playing the best oh gosh that's a great question gosh you got to go with louisville i mean they're just a bunch of beasts over there so um, I think they're doing a great job. I like the way they play. I think Danny's doing a great job. Um, I think, I think Pitt's doing well. They've had a great season. Uh, Wisconsin obviously went in the Big Ten. Um, you know, top four seeds are doing a good job. But then you got you know five, six seeds after that, where I think anyone can win it this year. So a lot of people are doing a good job. Um, and I think there's going to be some underdog stories because of the the teams that have COVID, the extra seniors, the transfers. I mean, the depth is crazy on some of these teams. And I, I do think we're going to see some different teams pop up that maybe aren't being talked about. Yeah, it is an interesting factor this year. 60 or seniors, um, COVID. <laughs> I mean, it's a really interesting wild card that we have never seen be never seen before. Okay, let's take let's talk our final four. BYU and who are the other three? <laughs> okay. Um, gosh, there's just so many teams that could that could fill that uh, spot. Again, I think Louisville, I think, you know, Texas, Baylor, I think Washington's playing well, uh, UCLA. I mean, any, any, of, any, any of the top teams that you guys have talked about, I think, um, you know, Utah's playing well. I think um, Pitt, you name it. I think it's, I think it's wide open. I think it's going to come down to who's healthy, like you talked about, who's playing the best volleyball, who's serving and passing it offensively. I like our chances because our offense has been really good all year. Um, that's one of our strengths is we've got, hitters in every position that want to take the big swings. If someone's not playing super great, we have other people that can step up. We're not dependent on one or two players, which um, I think is the strength of our team. Well, Ruth is smarter than the rest of us. So she's going to close this. 
<laughs> oh, thank you. I'm going to ask you after the show, what are you looking for me to do? But Heather, <laughs> think of this. If you had a choice and what are the advantages if the committee would seed all the way one through 32, what would it, how would the dynamics of the brackets in the tournament be different? Well, you'd play who you deserve to play. So I think that would be rightfully so earned for teams um, in all areas. You, you, you get what you earn throughout the season. So I think the excitement would be there every year. It'd be a different team that you probably open up with and your, your mm -hmm. journey through the tournament would be different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there would be some excitement. I, I, I'm not, I know the maybe committee is looking for the excitement of maybe some of the regional games. Mm -hmm. um, we already pretty much went that route with having the top four seeds play all the way through to the final four. So they get to play at home to create that excitement. I'm not sure why it has to be there for the first two rounds as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think it would be great for the fans, like you mentioned. I think people, I think you might get some some exciting matchups. And so I, th I think it's definitely something that needs to be looked at, that, that this our sport with how fast and how much it's growing definitely deserves. And I think people would be willing to pay money. If I had to fly somewhere or fly somebody in, I think some of the teams would be willing to fit, put that bill, which I don't, I'm not offering that, but I mean, we've got we to gotta have like, if there's a problem, let's find the solution. Like, uh -huh. what's the problem and how can we solve it? And let's let's go all in with it. Well, that's actually the second part of the question is, is how do you feel about the 400 miles, which you do? But it's interesting how it applies to some teams and it doesn't apply to other teams. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I think a lot of coaches want some answers to. Obviously, we're not sitting in that room and I think the committee's doing the best that they can with the information that they have. But even you guys being as smart as you are as coaches have different information that you're looking at that could probably help uh, see teams and, and get them to understand. Well, obviously, the, what basketball did with the Ken Palm and the Quadrants, I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the way that they're weighting their games in men's and women's. Women's now started, I think this is their first year, maybe second. I'm not sure if we're far behind that, but I, I would suggest that our committee and our sport should look at what basketball is doing and, and trend in that direction. Um, so you're not penalized for playing teams in your own conference you have no control over, um, mm -hmm. but you also are rewarded for, for playing tough games and winning on the road, home, neutral, all that should be rewarded. So do you see this equalization like the super seniors across really maintaining a higher level of play that this could continue just for another year or two and then we're kind of back to normal? Yeah, absolutely. I think this year it's a huge factor. You know, the reason why I think it's going to go back to normal, maybe in a couple of years, maybe, maybe in two is because we all got freebies this year for the most part, if your university could afford it, I've got two uh -huh. super seniors that, you know, make, makes me have, I have 14 kids on scholarship and uh, I didn't have to use my super seniors out, out of my 12 that goes away next year. So people not have to start making decisions. Am I going to give my super seniors money or am I going to bring in freshmen or transfers? So I do think We'll see it for maybe one more year. I think by 23, it might start to calm down, but I think the transfer portal is here to stay. So the super seniors are gone, but the super transfers are moving in. Yeah, there's, there's going to be, there's going to be that. And I think that's as long as that's available, people are going to take advantage of it. And it's, it's one of those things where even for us this year, if you don't get up with the times and, and change, and I, I saw Duke at coach K said, the one and done. He was resisting it for so long. And he just said, well, I, I might as well join him. And that's how I feel about the portal. If, if there's a right fit for you and um, we benefited this year from the right fit, some kids that helped us out, go for it. Maybe it works some years, maybe it doesn't. And I also mm -hmm. think there's some um, dangers to adding a bunch of transfers to your team. You've got to be able to manage that culture, uh, your yeah. returners and your new kids coming in. It's definitely a risk. Okay, Mick, you got one minute. Uh -oh. oh, well, I, I had uh, to throw this out there a little bit, but we had done some work on the actual performance of the teams, not not polls and all of that stuff, Heather. And, and we looked at various things like points scored per set uh, and looked at differential between hitting percentages of the opposition and your team for the whole season. And when you do that, uh, John Foreman, who's on the on the uh, show today, ran some numbers relative to conference results. And he came up to between 77 and 90 percent uh, accuracy using that those numbers. We have BYU in the top five and in some cases higher than that, using those formulas uh, 
for what you've accomplished this year on the court. Uh, do you think the committee should add a body of work, uh, meaning some statistics to this, uh, this selection criteria? Yeah, I think it would be great. I, I think that uh, it's, it's, if you're, Offense, your hitting percentage is a certain percentage and you're holding your opponents. I mean, those are good indicators for how successful you're going to be in the matches you've won. And so you guys are way smarter than me and have way more national championships between you, you guys that I trust what you're saying, that it's a great <laughs> metrics and that I don't know where we should or shouldn't be placed, but I know that our team's done a great job and we're proud of what we've done and we want to prove it in the NCAA tournament. We're hungry to prove it and, and just create the best experience for us, regardless of what people are saying. Well, okay. I have you. I have you coming out of that bracket, so we'll see. We'll see how how good our numbers are there. Sorry, Ruth. No, that's okay. Thanks, Heather, for making time for us, and we will follow you. And best wishes for a successful first round. And Thank thanks you all. Again. Thanks for your support. Yes, best for your family. Right. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Good luck, Heather. Thank you. Now let's bring on our next guest, and Mick, you have the pleasure of introducing him and let's see if he's the bus driver or if he's a passenger on the bus. <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, I, I, I called, called Travis Hudson, the head coach of the <laughs> Western Kentucky team last night. And of course he was watching his son in a basketball game. Uh, he <laughs> spent two minutes with me at halftime. And uh, I really appreciate that because I know how how hard it is to get to watch our kids play when we're coaching and you want every opportunity to do that. But, but tell us about the draw in this tournament. Western Kentucky um, received uh, some pretty good attention the first four weeks of the season. Then you go into the conference and you disappear from sight. And uh, as Brian said, you could go undefeated win 3-0-3-0 and your RPI would go down under the present uh, setup. Um, so what are you thinking about uh, the, the draw and the placement of the brackets? Uh, uh, how does this resonate with you and, and your team? Well, I hope, can you hear me okay, Mick? Yeah, I, hope you I hear you well. Yeah. All right, we're, we're on the bus, so we'll see how long this lasts. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, I've always kind of taken it, and it is what it is approach, you know? I mean, we are, we are never going to be – in the SEC or the Big Ten, and, you know, we are what we are at Western Kentucky, and, um, I, you know, we always use that non-conference time to try to schedule in a way that gets us noticed, and this year, to be quite blunt about it, our schedule's not as strong as it would normally be, um, but that was due to, I mean, we didn't get a conference schedule because of COVID until June, and so we, we you know, we didn't know, we didn't know who we were playing and when, and we threw it to be together the best we can, and, you um, we just take what's in front of us and, and deal with it as it comes. So you draw South Carolina in the first round. Um, that's an SEC team, but but they they've kind of uh, we watched them the first four weeks and we were excited about them. They had some great matches. They played a good tournament at home. They beat some people. We thought they were going to do something in the Southeast Conference, and then they kind of just seemed to to fizzle a little bit. Yet they got in the tournament. So in your scouting them, what are you thinking about this first round matchup? Yeah, well, it's interesting because, you know, this is a team that, that yes, they've struggled, you know, in the last half of the season. But they're a team that also, you know, stood up and beat Kentucky, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. And you don't you don't accidentally beat Kentucky. Uh, you have to have some players to, to be the team of that caliber. And. Um, you know, they, they lost one of their middles, Robinson, who was a really big piece for them. And I think that that's really hurt their continuity offensively. And um, they have pieces. They just have played in spurts from what I can tell. They, you know, their ball control can be inconsistent at times. Um, you know, the Manning kid offensively is a, can shoulder a big load for them offensively. But and they haven't defended. You know, I think they're giving up. Teams are hitting 244 or something like that against them. And, you know, as you know, Mick, you can't, you can't just go out and out slug everybody every day. And uh, they've, they've struggled getting people stopped. And we've, we've been pretty good offensively. And so hopefully we can carry that forward. Well, they, they've certainly given you a diet of uh, competition. Uh, South Carolina, if you can get by them, you get Georgia Tech, possibly. If you can get by them, you get Ohio State. Possibly, if you get by them, it's an all-state matchup with Louisville. Holy cow! I mean, they just they just threw you right in there, didn't they? 
Christmas. Well, let me let me assure you that was not my Christmas list I put together <laughs> uh, for the for the NCAA tournament. But you know what I know about our kids is they're tournament tested kids. I mean, these are kids that have played in the tournament year to year, and um, you know we will play well. You know, the Georgia Tech is going to be a huge challenge if we can advance. Uh, looking at them on film, they're so very good offensively. And I don't know if you've ever been in that building, but that is that is quite an atmosphere. It is as loud as anywhere I've ever been. And um, so, you know, ear. Earplugs. No, no, yeah. I, you know, this late in the year, it might be refreshing for our players to not be able to hear me. Um, <laughs> you know, they they may. I'm I'm banking on the fact they'll play better if they can't hear me. You know, this late in the year, um, but. You know, I mean, it's a tough bracket, but as I told our kids, you know, when you get to the NCAA tournament, it's supposed to get hard. And, um, you know, and, and so we, we will be who we are and we will play at the level that we've been playing. I, I feel so certain about that. And, and when it's time to, for us to bow out, we will. So Bob Bertucci played in a one, one, uh, one university state uh, for a while. He played in, in Pennsylvania where only Penn State existed in anybody's mind. Uh, but that didn't bother him. He went over there and just beat the heck out of Penn State in the first round uh, of the one time that he was at Temple there. Uh, is that something you guys, uh, Bob, want to talk about that? Maybe you've got a couple questions. Well, yeah, actually, Travis, I was wondering whether you thought there was going to be a, another Kentucky face-off, you know, first with Louisville <laughs> and maybe with Kentucky. Yeah, well, I mean, Bob, we, you know, a few years back, we had that epic five set match against Kentucky in the second round of the NCAA tournament. And then when we hosted, you know, we lost to Louisville in five. So we've been what a, what a remarkable time it is for the state of Kentucky. I mean, we have three teams that have been in the top 20 in college volleyball all year long. And, um, you know, it's it's a pretty amazing thing for our state to be able to to say that. And uh, but boy, both those teams. You know, I, I don't know that I want to see either one of them too quickly. They're both playing awfully well and they're awfully talented. And uh, so let, let's hope that's a problem. If we're still playing, if we're if we're on here talking about playing Louisville, I think I'll probably be a pretty happy coach at that point. There you go. Well, hopefully, hopefully you'll have a chance to play both those teams. Right. Uh, but but how do you feel like the season has gone you know, overall? Well, Bob, it's been this has been difficult. I, I mean, this has been difficult. I think the biggest thing that's going to play out in this tournament is who can stay in a good place mentally. Um, I, I don't think anybody really outside of this can really grasp how difficult it's been mentally and emotionally to play two seasons in one calendar year. And, you know, our kids, I mean, we've, we, we went undefeated in the spring in the regular season. We lost one time this fall and it's been the hardest thing I've ever gone through because our kids are just, they're just wrecked emotionally. They're just spent. They're, you know, and it's hard on them because it's the sport they love, but they don't walk in every day. Uh, and it's not natural. I mean, we all, you, you remember how long you need to recover after a season. And, you know, we had this small break and had to get right back at it again. And so I think it's playing out throughout college volleyball. I think it's why you see uh, so many upsets. I think it's why you see so many reverse sweeps. And I think the teams that advance in this tournament are going to be the ones that their coaches do the best job of keeping them in a good space mentally. How is the health of your team and, and how do you feel like your chances are? You know, yeah, physically, physically, I'm, I couldn't be happier. I mean, that was a concern too. Uh, you know how we would hold up physically, but physically we're in really, really good shape mentally and emotionally. You know, I made a decision a couple of weeks to go going into the conference that's how they went into the tournament you know as i told yeah i chose i chose i chose rest over rhythm you know we just we gave our kids a lot of time outside the gym just just try to get in a better place mentally and um so you know so far it's worked and and i feel good about where we are right now well, that's very interesting because I think sometimes, you know, less is more, they say, you know, I, um, I think this year, I think this year more than ever, I really honestly do, because I've got kids, you know, we always have two or three gym rats that just love being in the gym. And even, even the gym rats are sick of volleyball right now. It's just, <laughs> you know, nine, 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 10 months of this, you know, with very little break is just, it's too much 
uh, mentally. And, and so, you know, I'm really proud that we've held it together to this point. And, and that's going to be a challenge throughout this tournament with finals and everything else coming up for these kids, too. Well, well Travis, uh, Brian's been, been through this a number of times. So I'm going to turn it over to him. To let him ask you some more global questions that you might <laughs> awesome. have in the game. Well, what I've been through is, um, it's a long, old story, but uh, when I got the job at Long Beach a million years ago, uh, they said, oh, by the way, you need to get another license because you're driving the <laughs> minibus uh, to the game. <laughs> and uh, the good news was it broke down twice and it broke down and they blamed me. So then they got a bus from then on that I couldn't drive. So it worked. <laughs> So tell, tell, you know, congratulations. Another great season. I, I can't you. imagine a double season. I, I, I really didn't yeah. think about that until you just mentioned it. That's yeah. a lot. Mentally for it players, is. mentally for coaches is a different thing. Kids are resilient. You know, I, I hope you're going to make it through yourself here. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, it's like I said, it's been a real challenge for all of us involved. And, uh, and around the country, you know, as I reach out to other coaches. And again, I think it's going to be a storyline throughout this, this NCAA tournament, the ones that can hold themselves together mentally and emotionally and put their best foot forward. Who do you think is playing the best? You know, let's not focus on your team. Let's look. Who do you think is playing the best out there right now? Yeah, I, I still, you know, if, if I had to, you know, if I had to say, I still think Texas is built for this, you know, for this run. I think they're so physical. You know, what Danny and Louisville has done is amazing, but I've thought about them a lot in the last few weeks for because of what we've talked about. The fact that they've gone through this undefeated. And I, you know, I don't know, I don't know that a, a late season loss to Pittsburgh or something might not have helped them in a lot of ways. And I think it'll be interesting to see if they can maintain I mean they've been so very good all year long but that to me is the challenge you know I don't I guess what I'm saying is don't, I don't think this is the year that I would have predicted somebody to be an undefeated national champion because of the emotional and mental strain on everybody um, so I think Texas is is really built for this and, and I, Texas and Wisconsin are the two teams that I would not want to you know come across from a you know from a physicality standpoint as well as you know, the leadership and the depth and, uh, you know, all the pieces that it takes to, to win this time of year. I uh, truly appreciate the gauntlet you're going to go through. <laughs> I've done it. I've, I've <laughs> seen it and on the road and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. The, yeah. yeah. So let's say what, who are the other three teams in the final four besides, besides you? Oh man, like I said, I think Texas and Wisconsin are two teams that, that I wouldn't want to see uh, to the very end. Um, you know, with Kentucky being so close, I've kind of kept an eye on them. And I think they're interesting because, you know, we, we opened our season uh, with an with a, you know, exhibition game against them. And, you know, they were struggling to find themselves a little bit with a new setter and some new pieces. But Emma Grom has done a great job, and I think that they've continued to get better throughout the year. I think that, you know, a 3-0-3-0 weekend over Florida is a statement going into the NCAA tournament. And, um, and you know, so they're a team, they're a team too, that I think, you know, can make a, a really deep run again. Um, but I think this is a year where you're going to see a team or two that makes the Final Four that you may not have anticipated. Hmm. I, I just do, because I think that, I think there's, there's, you know, probably a dozen teams that are physical enough to do it, but it's going to be about who can get themselves right mentally, you know, five times in a row to get, you know, to four times in a row to get all the way to the final four. Yeah. Okay. So Travis, Ruth, thanks. Ruth is going to, Ruth, the hall of famer, Ruth Nelson is going to give us the final thoughts. Awesome. Not, not, not even a question. <laughs> Travis, thanks for making time on the bus for us. And we know you will do what you do best, and that's take one match at a time. And we wish we you will. best of luck. Well, Ruth, I can't thank you guys enough. It's an absolute honor to be in front of you, and um, I, you know, I'd love, I'd love to, I'd love to call you all back and get let you start telling me what I need to do. 
uh, from this end. So, because uh, I, I could sure use it because I'm, I'm pretty worn down too. But we're excited to be in it again. We're excited to represent our university and, uh, and looking forward to taking this group forward. All right. That's, Thank you again. Good luck, Travis. Yeah, good luck, good luck Travis. Travis. Okay. Thank you, guys. You missed one of our shows, jump over to Instagram and click on our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. Want to make a difference? Please remember to renew your AVCA membership. This one organization that represents all coaches at all levels when lobbying for the changes that are needed in our sport. And you can make a difference by registering at avca.org. We now close out today's buzz and please stay on as buzz reaction as master coaches will continue the discussion with their thoughts from the buzz and to look closely at RPI, AVCA, the, and the NCA championship seating. Special thanks to our Buzz and Buzz Reaction digital partner, Dr. John Foreman, for being part of our show and being definitely one of our influencers. <laughs>
South Carolina did beat Kentucky, as uh, as Travis said. And so you have to give them some credit. I thought they were going to be able to challenge in the Southeast Conference, but I guess losing that one player probably hurt them a lot. Um, and you, you guys, you see Todd Dagenet, uh just uh, got uh, coach of the year for the fourth time. Uh, and he's switching conferences. He's going to the Big 12 now when Central Florida goes to the Big 12. Uh, but he kicks off against Pepperdine. Who who are you guys betting on there? Is that going to be Central Florida? Is that going to be Pepperdine? I don't know. <laughs> Brian, I love it. You're supposed to have it. an opinion. You're supposed to have <laughs> an opinion. Well, I, I actually I have a, Creighton I've coming out, someone, though, Mick. Yeah, I've got several opinions on the <laughs> tournament itself. One is... Um, uh, what Heather talked about was what men's basketball is doing and their and women's basketball is adopting is called the we weighted games uh, raking, weighted games. So that takes, uh, it, it takes care of some of the problem that I've always said that if you are in a conference that isn't as successful and you win your matches 3-0 every time, your RPI is going to go down. So it waits games to try to eliminate that problem because it seems like Western Kentucky, no matter how good they are, their RPI is going to go down every week. It's going to get worse. So the weighted games is important. Um, if you look at the bracket, when it says they're seeding 16 teams, they're seeding many, many more than 16 teams because teams are moving all over the place, which I'm always disappointed when the committee makes their statement afterward and says that talks about in the first paragraph all the time about how much money they saved. <laughs> and I think that is not okay for players because in reality, I think you could see the whole tournament and cost a little bit more because you can see now that teams are flying all over anyway. Teams are flying so many places, even in a 400 mile rule is a fallacy because you end up flying anyway. You're supposed to drive while they fly anyway, and they're still moving around. So if you look at the board, you look at the bracket, there's so much movement. The third thing though, and is that is in areas that are well-equipped geographically like Southern California, in this case, Utah, they play the same teams every single year. I played the same teams in the tournament four years, the last four times we played. <laughs> you know, we're playing the same teams. You, yeah, you know, who that, you're that shouldn't be happening. I'm not, not for a sport that has almost every school in the country playing yeah. the sport. And they're drawing plenty of people, making plenty of money at the gate. Uh, you know, it needs to be seated at least the top 32 teams. And, yeah. and, and you still can find matches where you can save some money sure. and still have a, a fair event. Well, yes. here, in here in Texas, for instance, if you're Rice or uh, Texas State, yeah. you don't have a chance. You always are going to either Texas or Baylor. Which and is, yeah. the kids will tell you winning the conference championship is more exciting than going to the NC2A tournament because you don't get a chance to see other top-ranked teams <laughs> For the first time, uh, they've had a steady diet of those teams. A committee so, can point to themselves as being accurate. They're right in their picks because they're playing. They're taking teams that win almost all the time at home and allowing to be at home. You know, yeah. uh, if you took, uh, you know, my calculations were, you know, your hitting percentage for and then the hitting percentage against. That gap is always the best teams in my my analysis and the top four this year are the top four seeds. I think the top four in that area are the top four seeds, except for BYU in Western Kentucky. The problem with Western Kentucky is they, because as he explained, as Travis explained, he had no schedule. So because of that, he didn't get a good preseason schedule. He didn't really play anybody. I attempted to eliminate all of his conference and tried to get the top teams games that he played and see what that point differential was. But I could only find three matches that were 
acceptable to, to even look at. So Western Kentucky is, shouldn't have been seeded, but BYU, I took their top seven matches, the top seven matches eliminated all the others and their top seven matches, they still had the point differential, uh, percentage differential uh, that could have, they should have been, could have been and should have been in the uh, top four seeds. Could have been if a top four were, seed, right. Yeah, if they were in the top four seeds, Let's see other teams come and play them at home in the regionals. <laughs> you know, Utah okay, so doesn't like my that. question is how do, do you get this changed? Well, the committee needs to broaden the weakness of women's volleyball for the committee is that the press is not involved. If men's basketball and football, men's football, if the if they don't do it exactly right, as close as they can and do all their homework. The press is going to fry them, but there's no press that even does anything. You watch the show on TV, as, as you saw. The seating committee. I mean, the, the seating, seating was committee. terrible. Yeah, that was, the show was terrible. Misspelling of names, wrong schools. It just, was, it was thrown together. It was a mis terrible. But it, we're the press. We're, we're the, the yeah. press. Yeah. So we need the committee to be, to figure out a way to make it more fair for the player. So I, I say, Brian, throw in, throw in the percentage differential, throw in points per set scored, because listen, uh, any coach will tell you, you can have nobody on the other side. And sometimes kids can't hit the ball in bounds and score a point. So no matter who's over there, you still got to do that, right? You got to score points. You got to have 14, 14 and a half kills per set. Then you got to find another four points, either with block stuffs or serving aces. That I mean, that's the deal. You got to get over eighteen points per per game. Here, here are the here are the points per per set rankings. Ohio State comes in first, Texas comes in second, Wisconsin comes in third, and this will be a stunner for a lot of people. But Creighton comes in fourth. Creighton has eighteen point six kills per set. Where they, where they fall down, Brian, is in your percentage of holding down their opponents. So their, their offense is good. Their defense is suspect, but they rank high in that. BYU is fifth. Uh, Western Kentucky is tied with BYU in points per set scored. How about that? And then you've got Georgia Tech seventh and Louisville eighth. And they're all above 18.3 points per set. Now, I think that says something to the committee about who's scoring the ball, and that's how you win. And my daughter said to me one time, Dad, I don't know why you're worried. It's so simple. Just hit the ball on the floor. And, you know, <laughs> she's kind of right. Yeah. 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 If so the this, floor, is, it's okay. <laughs> this is yeah. what John says. For years, I've been su suggesting the top 16 – maybe even 32 out of the first round so that the weaker teams get to play each other much more competitive and generally matches with more at stake for those weaker teams. So you can seed those and they would have a buy. There you go. Now that that's another way to run the tournament, although nobody does that. And so you have to look at that very carefully why nobody else is doing that. What I wanted to say to Heather is, as she said, if we, if we seeded 32, we wouldn't have the problems, but we could have seeded 32 this year and they would have still played Boise or Utah yep. Valley as yep. long as Boise or Utah Valley wouldn't have been in the top 32. And in this case, Utah would have been in the top 32. So they most likely would not have seen Utah until the third round, not the second round. And that was my point of going over the uh, over the tournament. Uh, after we got all, all of it out here that we wanted to talk about is looking at these matchups. My, my position in the last few years has been teams have gotten knocked off too early and some teams have, have slid through all the way to the regional finals and hadn't, hadn't, haven't had to play a top level competitor just simply by the placement on the bracket. And so I think you have to look at the potential of how team is advanced through the tournament. If, if I did this right, I have in the top left, I have Louisville playing Florida, although with Caesar now uh, dropping off the team at Florida, they lose one of their top left sides who scores three to five points per set. Uh, so they may not be able to come out there. I had 
I had o Ohio State against either Western Kentucky or Georgia Tech. I had Baylor versus Minnesota, and I had UCLA versus Wisconsin. Those are first round of regionals. Those are some pretty good matches. On the other side of the bracket, I had Pitt versus Penn State. And quite honestly, right. do you know that Penn State has better stats than Pitt sure. in some of these categories? I think Penn State's got a heck of a draw. They, they get by Pitt in the second round. And how do you like to be Pitt? You get seated third and you get Penn State in the second round. And, and I'm assuming both of them win in the first round. You got Oregon and Creighton. You got BYU and Utah at Utah. Uh, at BYU, excuse me. And then the one nobody's talking about is Dayton Purdue. Dayton's won their last nine or 10 matches. They're, they're, they were in the tournament last year, almost had Washington out of the tournament. Uh, they're going to get uh, up against Purdue at Purdue. They pull off that upset. What does that do for BYU then? If they beat Utah and go, go to the next round, does BYU have a a good run at, at Dayton and then get into the finals against either Pitt or Penn state or Oregon, you know, or Creighton who nobody's talking about. And then in the bottom one, uh, I think that's all Texas, Kentucky. I think those teams slide in there. The one that you might want to watch is Nebraska versus Kentucky. I think Nebraska gets by Campbell gets by either Florida state or Kansas state. Uh, they're going to meet Kentucky out there in the first round of the, uh, uh, of the regionals uh, with Washington playing Texas and Washington and Texas is a great matchup because Washington is huge in the middle and that no one has taken on Texas with huge middles. And, and Texas has got two middles that score one behind and one in front uh, that have been uh, kicking up their points per game here the last end of the season. And all at once Washington comes in with huge defense at the net. Will that slow that big machine down of Texas that's been scoring the ball so well all year? They've been scoring 18.6 points per set. So they're right in the hunt, right up there with Ohio State and, and Wisconsin at 18.6. So uh, I just think, uh, I think where the teams are put on the bracket really makes a difference. And that's why, Brian, I liked your idea of seeding the tournament. Uh, even if you can't seed all 64, you could seed 32. And that way, in the first round, you wouldn't be having some of these first round matchups that we're seeing. Uh, I mean, how about Rice versus USD in the first round? Holy <laughs> well, cow. My concern is the committee is going to look very good because so many good teams are going to be eliminated on someone else's home court. So it's, it's really not fair that there's so many top second round matches um you know utah and byu is one and washington's another one they're just uh, you know these are sacrifices uh, for very good teams they shouldn't be second round games and i and i know the committee will say well the ncaa will determine how many teams can be seated but you can play with the rule uh, and try your best because they're again take a look at these brackets that are on the screen now and how many teams are traveling anyway they're they're it's costing money so and as heather said you know teams are willing to pay well they got to make a bid process anyway and if the bid process goes up high enough it's not going to cost the ncaa much money at all so uh i just think it's it just needs to it can be done better it, they're doing the best to be fair in their parameters, they need to expand the parameters without having to change what the NCAA will allow them to do. And all they have to do is change the criteria that they use and then make the movement, you know, you got movement all over the place. That's my, my concern. Well, it's hard, it's hard. The NCAA committee is gonna get credit for taking the, the, the regionals and to the home sites because of the increased attendance. But if you look across the country, there's increased attendance at every match in the country almost. Uh, used to be, if anybody had a thousand fans, that was a good deal. Now we got teams drawn 7,000 regularly. We got teams drawn 5,000 regularly. We got teams drawing 3,000 regularly. That's for 12 or 13 home matches. So I, I, I don't know. I. Uh, I was on the committee when we went to regional sites that weren't home sites for teams. 
we picked four regional sites and I thought that was a good idea at the time. Um, it might not have been the right time maybe, but now it seems to me is the right time. But, but the problem they've had is those regional sites bid for those tournaments, they get them in, but they don't promote them at a high level. And that's the NC to a committee's responsibility to make those sites that bid for them do well. You know, you know how, uh, uh, sites fight for those basketball regionals. Dayton almost always hosts one. Um, Southern California always tries to get one down in Orange Orange County. Or well, the city, the cities. Yeah, you know, they go yeah. to the city sports commission and get them to get involved. It's it's like here, the Dallas Sports Commission. Look what they did. They got athletes unlimited. They got the women's basketball to come in. If you have someone that's politicking with those sports commissions to bring them in, but it's like you know, anything else, you, you must have those contacts or you got to make the initiative. Because well, you got to get the people there. You got to yeah. get the people butts in the stands. That's really what you need. Well, you know? I think the first step has to be that they seed at least 32 teams and then they have to start looking at, at neutral sites, you know, down the road. Uh, I, I don't know if we're ready to go back to neutral sites right now, but we definitely have to do something about the, the seeding. Uh, and, and making and, and giving the athletes a chance to see more than the same team every year that, that that's kind of unfortunate for them I remember well, I remember one year we were a really good team and we ranked in the top 16 and uh, we didn't get a bid for, we didn't get it we're supposed to get the top 16 but geographically we weren't any the way did just didn't bet so they made us travel locally and I remember we played this team that had only lost one match at home all year and they ended up at the final four and all that except for the coach who was Mick it was, uh, it was a pretty good team <laughs> you know he cheated, he cheated in the fifth game which he always did so but it was <laughs> my point was that it was a it was a tough uh you, you know it's a tough draw for a top 16 team going to a home court that a team never loses and they go to the final four. And that's a pretty tough draw for those athletes. But, it, okay. but it's a tough sell to the NC2A committee. And I, I just want to say this one thing is if you look at the tournament this year, the second and third rounds have never been so exciting as they are yeah. this year. But even though they're that exciting, it doesn't mean they're right. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they're correct. Um, and all, all I'm suggesting is we could get the same kind of excitement, but maybe some people need to be readjusted in, into positions that they've earned through their uh, execution and uh, their ability to score points or hold their, hold their opponents down while they scored points throughout the year. And I think that added to the tournament gives it a little bit more credibility uh, this match is this year, this most exciting tournament in the history of the NC2A tournament, as far as I'm concerned. The quality of the match matchups, uh, not because of the seeding, but because of the quality of the teams this year, the, the fifth and sixth year uh, players that are allowed to play, the, the quality all the way down through 32 or 33 is just exceptional. Okay, uh, so and, Mick, yeah. I look back on spring tournament. Yeah. And why did things get changed with ESPN coverage? Remember, they weren't going to do anything the first round. Then they did, said they might do something. I think what happens is coaches are either in it to make sure the sport gets better or they're in it to make their own program better, or they might be both. Or you've got people that are here saying, I'm just glad to be here. So to me, there was enough of coaches that started basically saying, listen, we need coverage on ESPN. We need this. And I don't think there seems to be, and it's no different than Mick, when you were coaching, Brian, you were coaching, Bob, you were at Tennessee or Rutgers. There's not enough of those coaches that care about what happens to the sport. They can say they do, but are they making the initiative? It's kind of like Kathy DeBoer was doing. Okay, let's do the coalition. Let's get, you know, let's get support behind it. What's happening with some of the colleges? Parents start complaining as an alumni, you know, so... I think you got to get more coaches. Well, I, I think if I re recall right, the reason we got TV last spring, we weren't supposed to get TV. And between the coaches and mm -hmm. the coaching association and our executive director, 
to Deborah, we started we started to negotiate yep. with from a little stronger yes. position. And then we started pointing out what women's basketball gets, even though women's volleyball is the most popular sport in the country for girls and the fastest growing men's sport for boys uh, in collegiate uh, in the collegiate schools. Uh, the committee still wants to compare us to a non-comparable sport. We're by ourselves. So we started comparing ourselves to what men, men's basketball gets and women's basketball get, was getting. And I think that's one of the reasons why we got the TV, but it was a, it was a struggle. If we did, didn't have a coaching association and that's another reason why the coaches should all make sure they pay their memberships and, right. and are in the association because we have no lobbying power to get some of these things improved without those people all being supportive of our uh, ABCA. So uh, I, I, that's how I saw that. And, uh, and you're right. I, I think it's going to take all of us to keep pushing that, but I mean, it's interesting. It's, it, whoever was saying this, uh, that we're the news source right now. We're the only news <laughs> news show for volleyball in the country. Uh, I, obviously, if ESPN would put us on full time, right, uh, we would right. have to work so hard that we probably quit. But uh, <laughs> uh, but it'd be fun, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, Ruth, can I just uh, kind of summarize here because yep. I think for the audience, I think we need to push to have weighted games done by the committee and the NCA committee. I think that the new rule needs to be adopted that you can't go to the same place two years. Uh, two years in a row, meaning if like you can't play, they have the rule that no two conference, the same conference can't be in the first or second round to face each other. They also need to adopt that you cannot play, go to the same place uh, the follow, you know, the following year. It has to move, um, and the committee must start looking at without getting permission to seed, but to move things around that are more equitable call it what you want, seating or not seating. But I think these things can be adopted uh, by the committee and the NCA probably would go along with those. It's just a rule and it would take care of a lot of the problems that we're having for this tournament. That's all I wanna say. No, that's excellent. Okay, Bob, yes. since we're getting short on time, let's let you take a few minutes and talk about what you've been testing with your six on six competition with ways to make your practice is competitive, efficient, and effective all at the same time. Now, don't tell our viewers everything as you'll need to come. They <laughs> need to come to our court session on Friday, December 7th, 115 to 215 on court two, and the follow by our classroom discussion at 230 to 330 in the AVCA Theater Hall B. Do not give them too much information. Mr. Bertucci. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little bit of information. Okay. Teaser, Bob. Uh, teaser. We, we are. We all. We, we've been testing. Uh, you know, ways that you're going to be able to train when you're playing six on six, all right, and still be able to maybe. You know, in, in some cases we were training nonlinear passing, all right, and I I tried it in in a drill setting, and then we tried it in a, a six on six setting where we actually would work with, you know, taking away points, adding bonus points, uh, you know, if the technique was correct, or if, if a particular aspect of the game, maybe you wanted to work on hitting balls to the cross court corner, deep cross court corner. Uh, and, and you would, if you hit the ball, ball there, you might get two points instead of one point. Uh, and it was interesting to see how the athletes responded to that. And I've just gotten finished up speaking to each one of my athletes and, and of course one of the questions was you know what did you like what did you didn't didn't like during the during the fall and almost to a to a guy they really enjoyed the six on six where if they lost a point or gained a point all right they felt like that really had an impact on 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 their uh development as players and as a team uh, yeah. Tried, I tried your idea on the serving, Ruth, and okay. uh, and to my amazement, they <laughs> actually could, they could do it. I mean, half the times with the guys, you just want them to get the ball in the court. Uh, here I am telling them they have to serve the ball to the penetrating setter, 
all right, and and take the take the team out of the offense. I had no no. If you do that, you get an extra point, and they did it. I was like, okay, oh, guess God. what? You did an excellent job <laughs> not giving them too much information. Hey, a very <laughs> special shout out to over one hundred and twenty one guests who have shared their insights with us over the past 80 weeks. And Mick summarized that and said almost two years. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website at volleyballmastercoaches.com. Click on the contact form. And we look forward to customizing an in-person clinic for you. Don't forget to take advantage of our Master Coaches Stream 18 full-length on-demand video series by heading over to Instagram, VB Master Coaches, or to our website, volleyballmastercoaches.com. 2021 AVCA Convention in Columbus, Ohio, December 15th to the 18th, and you can jump over and still register today at avcaconvention.org. Be sure to tell your friends about our weekly news show and do not forget to send your questions or your feedback from our buzz or buzz reaction. Thanks for joining us today and we will see you next week on the buzz and good luck everyone this weekend and watch lots of volleyball. <laughs>